Well, that figure has over doubled this year alone. And it's a lot of money. You've got to lose a couple of green staff. You can't have any machinery. You need to half your budget. You know, I was borrowing a huge amount of money from the bank to get over the line. We rebuilt the entire golf course, greens, tees, irrigation, the lot. So it did have a bit of a bad reputation. Certainly the key to this business is the team. Hi everyone, welcome to the 442 podcast. And today, Liam, We've got a different one. We've got a bell to have actually got a golf club owner. Wow. It ain't anywhere near as good as it's cracked up to be, I can assure you. It sounds good to me. I'd like a... <laughs> that always oh, sounds dream, great. Dream job. Oh, for goodness sake, yeah, obviously. We need to talk, John. We need to talk. That so, bad or that good? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's fantastic. Obviously, it's, you know, I, I understand why everybody thinks that of what, you know, I do and what a lot of people work here do. But the trick is to get something right. You know, it's, in any walk of life, it's hard work, you know, and, and uh, it's like the swan, isn't it? You don't see what's going on underneath. But no, it's, it's great. It's been 20 years of my life and, you know, I wouldn't change a single thing, you know. So today we're at Caris Green up in Kendall. We've played today. We've had a, an even match, eight points each, all of us. Fantastic. Done a shot scope nice challenge. You've done 12 foot, I think. 12 feet, yeah. We didn't bother playing that hole, did we, John? We didn't, actually, uh, Liam. No, we made a right hash of that hole, but uh, it was good to watch Graham playing that hole. He played it very well. Well, you, you managed to put a couple of balls in my office, which is very generous <laughs> of you. I do need the help, so thank you for that. Still haven't had them back, by the way. Yeah, no, no, we've no not. you won't see them. No, they're gone. <laughs> we, we touched on it, uh, Graham, out on the course earlier on this morning there, and, and we said, you know, you took over the golf course in 2003, so just 20 years in. Blimey. Can't believe that for a start. Yeah, uh, just one of those things. I'd, I'd sold a, um, I'd been involved uh, with a business in uh, catering butchers to supplying hotels and restaurants. That business got sold, and then I was, you know, wondering what I was going to do with the rest of my life. And then lots of other, lots of options, lots of job offers, lots of ideas, and just out of nowhere, really, it was just one of those strange little quirks of fate that a friend of a friend suggested that I'd come down to Caris Green. I'd never actually even been here before. Uh, there was a golf course in existence here which had been started by Fred Downham, who was the, the landowner, the farmer, and he'd, he'd diversified from uh, his, his, his farm to, to build a golf course here. But um, he decided that, you know, he'd taken it as far as he could and he was wanting to sell. So... And I, I, it was one of those, I was 50-50 whether he even came. It was one afternoon and we came down and, and and the rest is history, you know. Can I get some context on that? Do you play golf then? I did, yeah. I'm, I'm historically a rugby player. Uh, we got, I got injured um, and then I played cricket, not particularly well, but um, that, that was my sport and dabbled at golf, really. I was never really that into it, in and out of it. Um, and then... Probably about the mid '90s, during the golf boom, I got more in, more, more involved. My father was heavily involved at Kirby Lonsdale Golf Club, which is local, and he was one of the first people to set that up. So I was quite involved with him at Kirby Lonsdale, and I just got sort of fell into it really on the basis I couldn't play my rugby anymore, um, and I ended up heavily involved there. In fact, I think it, I was 28, so around about the ter about year 2000, I was Greens chairman there, believe it or not, at a very young age. So yeah, so kind of got a rough idea in a golf course what it should look like what it should be then yeah. Greens chairman yeah that's right I mean it was that that the whole Kerbal Onsel experience was extraordinary because that was a, a, a club built by the members for the members it was a very different experience than you know this which is obviously you know owned and run by me we were all in it together and and the job that only only had its difficulties make no mistake but to get that golf course to standard it is now it was an extraordinary job you know my father was pivotal in the middle of that so I don't want to be rude here you're a Greens chairman at Kirby Longsdale, 25 minutes down the road. Yep. You have never been here. So, about being a golf club snob, I take it, it weren't a great golf course. It was entry level golf. I think that's fair to say. You know, it was the, 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 where we are now here was just basically the farmyard, just a derelict farmyard. Um, the, the clubhouse was a converted carving shed and it had a tiny little flat on top two room flat I actually lived in that flat for eight years so you should do all the catering up there so I would literally do um it's like the Tommy Cooper sketch with the hats I would literally do everything and that's how it was there was Dave Turner Phil Hudson who's still with me both of them still with me 20 years later and myself and a few other um a few other sort of part-time and that was it it was a, a, a bones operation so I'm taking you back 
you come here, first impressions then? Uh, quite interesting, actually, because I walked into the pro shop, and uh, I say pro shop, it was the, the little shed thing, and Dave Turner was there, uh, who was already in place before I came, and he could see, he was thinking, what, what you know, because he knew who I was, what are you doing here? And I was with my father, and my father at that time was suffering very badly with his health, uh, didn't have long to live, but we decided we'd come and play golf. So we, we paid the green, <laughs> went up to the first hole, which is a little par three, and played that, it's very nice. And then you walk over the bridge there, and we got to the bridge, having never been here before, and just looked up and down the river, looked around, and I remember saying to my dad, well, if I can't make something of this, then it's time to give up. This is stunning. It's absolutely beautiful, you know, the river and the trees, and, and that was it. We made the decision there and then to have a go at it, you know. So, but how did that happen? How do you buy? A golf club. How do you buy a golf so club? So you're here, you're on the river, you made the decision with your dad. And yeah. Then... Well, you walk back to Fred's house and you knock on his door and you say, Fred, Fred I'd so, like to. So he lives I'm... on site then? He did, yeah, he still does. He still lives over there in the farmhouse. He's still in the same place and just knocked on his door and said, I'm Graham Curtin, you don't know who I am. This is my dad, Mike, and um, we'd, like to buy, uh, we'd like to buy a golf club. How do we go around that? <laughs> Was that immediately after you walked off the golf course yes. or did you have a couple of days no, to think about things? No, I just knew straight away. I just looked around. There's so much potential. Um, I suppose, it, you know, having not been here, you know, it did have a bit of a bad reputation in terms of, you know, other... Let's say posher clubs found it very easy to criticise it as, as as a startup club, but, but you, know. you didn't come, so it must have been true. I'm just putting it out there. I'm black and white. I'm just <laughs> yeah, saying, yeah. if you did, if you were round the corner, you would have known what it was like. So it mustn't have been good enough for you to come and have a game of golf. Um, well, I lived in Kirby Lonsdal, in fairness, so I'd, it was it, it was just not really. You know, you, you play at your own club, so I, I didn't really have a particular opinion on it until I got here. You know, and I was, you know, I was absolutely blown away by it. It was, it, 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 it's, it's the potential. You're looking at the potential. You know, it was 20 years ago. It, it was a lot different then than it is now, but um, it just, it had something there that it could become something very special. I mean, it was even now. I mean, it's picturesque. I imagine that first day, like you said, you've walked across the bridge, you've looked up and down the river, it's stunning. Yep. Yep. So the game of golf really was to walk around and to see actually what you could do, how sure. much land you had. Absolutely, just get a feel for it. Scouting the area out. Absolutely. Well, critically, just by the car park here, there's these two fields which we're looking down on now. Um, without getting too complicated, any golf course that's owned privately pays VAT which you might think isn't much, but non-golf courses, like the local golf courses, they're not. So you're 20% behind the market before you start. Now, no one can operate in a market 20% behind everybody else. Unfortunately, the government of this country seems to think that golf's immune from that, and I spent 20 years fighting it, but, but there it is. So what we needed to do was get another stream of income which would put us on parity with other golf courses, and that was the driving range. And that was the absolutely crucial very first... In fact, I actually started building it before I even got here, when we were in the heads of terms part of the agreement. So I knew I needed to get that driving range up to get the income in to do what I wanted to do with the rest of the golf course. So you were actually making investments before you had finalised the deal? was actually, yeah. I was actually working on site, um, I think it would be in the January and February on, with a digger out on the driving range, putting the foundations in. And we didn't actually sign up until May. So that's a bit, looking back, possibly not the smartest thing I've ever done, but, you know, I was, um, I was fairly committed to it. I think you are buying it on trust as well, with, you know, with the farmer. Yeah, he would, yeah. He would have let you do that. He's not, you're not just done it yourself. You would have yeah. got some sort of permission. Well, I think you've got to be committed. I mean, as a friend of mine says, you know, it's a bit like egg and bacon, you know, that the hen's involved, the pig's committed, you know, and that's where you need to be. You need to be absolutely right and you need to be there. And that was my... I knew I'd pull it off. I just knew I would. And believe me, you know, I was borrowing a huge amount of money from the bank um, to get over the line. It was, it, 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 was, it was a hairy process, you know. I'm going to just drop you back a bit. Was it a nine or 18 hole? Or? It was 18 holes. It had originally been a nine hole. And then and I can't remember the exact date, but not that long before I bought it, been extended to 18. Without being rude, a proper 18 or just an 18 short um, It was quite threes, short, a lot. a lot of par threes. Um, it, obviously, it was new, so it needed a lot of time to, you know, what we have now with the, with the mature trees and that wasn't there then. What I would say, and I think this is, this is the absolutely fair say, is I think the layout was pretty good. It's pretty good, you know, it is picturesque, it's got all the features, it's got all these rivers, you know, it's got, you know, obviously we've built an awful lot, but the nuts and bolts of the layout were 
were there. You know, you could see them. Anybody who is interested in golf and playing golf. And I'd done quite a lot of golf design work at Kirby Lonsdale. I'd spent some time with two designers called Marnock and Gaunt, who went on to become really successful um, course designers all over the world. And I had a day with them at Kirby Lonsdale. Most extraordinary learning day in golf I've ever had and their ethos was designing a golf course is just like getting a examination question there's not bits of the question you can't see or there's some bits of it you don't understand you have to understand what it is that you're being asked and that's how they saw golf design you have, it's what you see is what you get now sometimes you don't get that on a links course for example you know there are, there, there are hidden traps all over the place but their ethos really inspired me that day and from then on in that's where, you know, we, we thought, I can do something with this golf course, you know. So that day with them, with the course designers, actually saved you a lot of money? Absolutely, yeah, it did. Because funnily enough, we never actually got course designers in here. You know, when we rebuilt in 2014, 2015, <coughs> we rebuilt the entire golf course, greens, tees, irrigation, the lot. And that was that was done in-house. I can't even believe I'm saying it. Wow. But it was. I mean, just, because I've been on the greens committee as well, so irrigation. Yes, I remember because I'm at Charlton, that could have been 10 years ago, 300 grand. Mm, I can believe that, yeah. I think so. You had we, no We did it slightly yet. differently we, with, with, with the help of some people within the industry that we knew. Those are the kind of quotes that we were getting for tees and greens. But what we, instead of going to a bespoke irrigation company, we, we sort of bypassed that through a supplier and just got all the bits and bobs that you would need, all the, the heads and all the control boxes and everything. We actually did it ourselves. And including that we've got two boreholes, which go down over 167 metres, which we use the water for the, for the whole place. Uh, it cost us under 70,000 just for the irrigation. I'm, um, uh, yeah, it was I'm just getting really... listen, you, if you're watching this, great, but if you're not and listening to this, courts are 300,000, but you have designed the golf course. Yep. Irrigated it. Yep. In house. Yep. For about 70 grand. Yep. Mad. Amazing. Hmm. We used our own labour. I mean, you, yeah. you have to cost in a bit of labour cost, but you've got that anyway. But yeah, that was. Um, yeah, that was uh, Nigel Hurst, who, who's not with us anymore, bless him. He helped me out hugely. Works for Henry Armour, who's one of our main suppliers. He was he was pivotal in, in helping me, you know, bring that in. For, and it's fantastic. So here we are, you know, whatever it is, seven years later. And it, not that we ever need to use it very much in the Lake District. What's your favourite hole you designed? What is my favourite hole that I designed? Well, there's was, there was a few of us designed. It wasn't just me, but I think the hole I like the most on this golf course is the ninth, which isn't necessarily one of the signature holes. That was just a straightaway par four, about 400-yard par four. And what we did was we extended, we put a pond in down the left-hand side, took the tee back a bit and put the green over that. So it's a 500-yard par five. It's reachable in two, but you've got to carry the pond to get there in two. And it, it just plays... It looks right and it plays right. It's just it, sometimes it just happens that way. I would say that one. I was really pleased. It's a good hole. It is a good hole. Yeah. The par, yeah, well, I'm going to say the par three is here. A solid. The, Some that, are not uh, long. No. But you've got the rivers running all the way around yeah. them. They're solid. If you get there's five par threes here. If you score five threes pars on your card, you'll always have a good round of golf. Always. I think I'd say that to most golf courses. Yeah, you probably me, could. Yeah. Not a great well, I see some of them are, You know, they've got their issues. The first, it's only, you know, 130 yards, but we've just put some more bunkers in. That's tricky. I know there's um, the 10th hole, when we had the Northern PGA event here, which we've had, and there's some very good golfers, and I'm sure he won't mind me mentioning a very good friend of ours, a good friend of the club's Phil Archer, who's... Yeah, my mate, so, yeah. A, a, your mate, a total class act. You know, I remember watching him two rounds in a row, knock it into the river beyond the green. It's very easily done. Even though it's only 140 yards, it, the, the wind swirls round. There's, there's lots can go around. And, of course, you've got the 18th here, which, uh, you know, is, is, is probably most people's idea of a golf nightmare, because <laughs> there's quite a lot that can go wrong. It was certainly my nightmare, I know that. Oh, you loved it. You loved it. I, I loved the hole. I wish I could play it better. <laughs> Got yeah. four for two. You did all right. Yeah. Four for two is all right. Yeah. yeah. What I'm going to say then, give us three, three of your best decisions. Three of my best decisions since I've been here. Um, not including actually coming here in the first place. I think, I think we touched on this when we were out on the golf course before. In 2010, uh, 2011, when I got the permission 
what I did was apply for planning permission for the clubhouse, which you see now. But at the time, right in the middle of the financial crisis, commercial building, you've got no chance of going to a bank. So what I did was I got permission for the uh, the flats, the four flats over there, Karras House, which is the big house, and the three townhouses. And the idea was to build and then sell those, and with the money that I'd got from selling those, would go towards funding the clubhouse. And what happened in that time is I met, through a friend of a friend, uh, my now business partner, Maurice Cotter. Morris has been hugely successful in uh, financial uh, business. He had his own company, which he sold out. And he was a golfer. He's, he, he was top class rugby player. Um, he was he played for Waterloo when they were winning absolutely everything in Lancashire, the Bill Beaumont years. Uh, very successful rugby player, played golf. And he used to come up here with his son, Max, and, you know, we, we, we became friends. And, you know, while I would say it's probably the, the best decision I've ever done was getting involved with Morris, and I think I said this on the course, I'm fairly sure he would probably say it was the worst decision he ever made, getting involved with me, because it never seems to stop. There's always, there's always another idea. But, yeah, I'd have to put that right at the top of my list. Uh, of making that decision. It was in this room, funnily enough. Morris and I once sat down and, and, and talked about what we wanted to do and we decided that, yeah, we could we could push this on further. This was before we'd rebuilt the course, uh, before we'd done, you know, a lot of the other branches of the business, such as the holiday lets. And, you know, it's just gone from strength to strength. Morris is, you know, is a very, very smart man, um, thinks outside the box and it's been a real education working with him, you know. Number two. Number two, I think... You'd have to go back to recruitment. And I won't say specifically who, because we've got, you know, an awful lot of people who've been with me from the start. But the key to any business, and certainly the key to this business, is the team that you get behind you. And in all areas of the business, whether it be the driving range, the golf shop, the kitchen, front of house, management, the golf course itself, um, wherever you want to go, the, the the people within there, especially at the moment, they're the absolute bread and butter. They're the key to the success of this place. I've got, at the moment, in the kitchen, head chef, I've got young Joe, who you get a huge amount of pleasure from, you know, bringing people on from, you know, from, from lower chef levels down. He's an absolutely shining example of, of somebody doing well for himself, working hard, knuckling down, part of the team. I've got uh, a good friend of mine, Mike Turner, who runs the whole... Uh, driving range and golf shop he's in charge over there he's doing a fantastic job takes all that pressure off me i don't have to get involved in that i've got margarita as you know you've met who's running the whole show and the and the uh, the development side of it and of course uh, i think you've met warren warren bevan out on the golf course well, and, and, and his job. team yeah. He is doing a good yeah job. he's been here for three years bless him he came um just before lockdown and we had all sorts of problems with the golf course we'd got horrific disease into the uh, anthracnose and uh, you know we've had a quite a lot of issues over the years with, with problems but that one was pretty serious right when was that we got anthracnose in it was just before so that'd be 2019 the 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 the, the autumn before covid which is 2020 wasn't it no i'm gonna have to say it because were the greens that bad where you were turning folk away or giving them a rate what was just so cheap? We did everything we could. We were we were phoning at anybody who was booked up to come on holiday here, visiting parties and saying, you know, come by all means, but the greens are terrible. You know, we've got this disease in them. And it literally came overnight. It was... I, I think some of the problems with the, with the greens were historic through, you know, a combination of bad luck and bad management. Uh, but the actual... When it when it happened, felt like it was literally over a weekend. We had the Trilby Tour here in June, very successful event, televised event. We've done loads of them. You would never have guessed there was a, a, a latent problem in them greens, which a matter of weeks later, they were going to be ended. But that's exactly what happened. Is there no chemicals or anything to get rid of it? Well, that's... There used to be, there used to be virtually a chemical for everything, but one of the main problems, and I'm just writing a, a, a piece on this for our new newspaper, we're launching a newspaper at the club, is how difficult it is in modern times to run a golf club, funnily enough, and there's not just the recession and everything else. Legislation is one of them that the EU and the UK have legislated against most fertilisers, virtually all pesticides, and where previously, in this case, a fungicide, you'd have put something down, they're not available anymore. And that is... I don't want to be horrible here. But, but you can, can you not be. get them? No. No, you can't. You can't. 
You can't. And if you could, I wouldn't even know where to start, Liam. Would it be the case, though, Graham, that obviously you said under EU stipulation you're yep. not allowed pesticides and everything else. Yep. Now we're not in the EU, has nothing changed? Uh, yeah, it has changed. It's got worse. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, it's got worse. Great. But you know, you, no, I, look, the green agenda in this country is absolutely right and I don't think anybody's going to argue with it and I'm not going to argue with it. And as custodian of this place here, we, you know, we've got, and Warren's very, very committed to all this, but there's got to be with all things there's got to be some give and take and if we go down the route we're going down at the moment with golf you're going to get and it will happen a major event is going to be taking place somewhere and it might not even be able to take place because you know the, the fusariums the anthracnoses all these different diseases these airborne diseases if you're not you know if you're not treating right and you haven't now got the right tools to do that in america they've got them all you can do what you want in america here you know you, so that being the case, then, you can see maybe further down the line, the bigger picture, to assure the tournaments are going to go ahead, will there be more tournaments abroad and we miss out? Maybe. Maybe. But sometimes when you look at some of these tournaments, and you just sort of alluded to that, is how you get older stuff, there is an awful lot of people, me included, think, I'm not sure you've got older product there at, let's say, you know, one of the... Premier Gold that, 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 that I can't get hold of. So you think that goes on, yeah? It's just an opinion. I can't prove it. <laughs> it's an opinion. It's, it, it's but, just an opinion. But sometimes yeah. you scratch your head and think, well, yeah. I'm not sure this is a level playing field here, but who am I? To, I'm just, I don't know. I just, just surmising. I'm just surmising, absolutely. So number two was staff. Number three. Number three, and this is best decisions since I've been here. I have, probably have to say um, the decision to rebuild the golf course because that was a massive decision um at the time i remember to, Mor morris to this day well he accepts it now he just didn't understand why we'd want to do that why do you want to go and because if you're going to rebuild a golf course you'd be probably looking certainly if you got somebody in to do it now mind you the way prices are now it could be any, you'd be looking at a couple of million easy <laughs> absolutely easy you're getting towards you know, you're probably getting towards 100 grand a green now just in, in materials. It, it, it's an incredibly expensive job in the modern world now that the world's gone crazy. And, I, you know, I remember saying, Morris, no, you trust me, the things that people want at golf courses is they want good greens and they want a good clubhouse. No one remembers the semi-rough. It's just how it is. And, you know, we made that decision to do it. And I'll be really honest with you, if... You know, this is, you know, eight years later or whatever it is. I couldn't do it now because we did it over two winters. And, you know, bless the members, they they knuckled down for us because nine holes were obviously closed one winter, then the other nine the next winter. While we set about creating what looked like the Battle of the Somme, while we dug the entire golf course up, you know, with diggers and trailers. And it was a an extraordinary difficult experience. But... The result of it all, the, the the end product now, when you look at these Stunning. incredible surfaces that we're producing yeah. now, and you know, and the, you see people walking past your office going, "Oh, no, it's beautiful scene yeah. for your office, isn't it?" It is, yeah, yeah. Well, it's good and bad because when we had all the disasters, I was sat there watching everybody walking past, you know, wondering what on earth they'd just paid the money to play on those greens for. You you see it both ways, you know, and, and well, we're talking you know, of both ways. Three worst decisions because you can't get everything right. No, the three worst decisions I've ever made. I'd love to say I don't make bad decisions, but I probably make more bad ones than good ones. I think the first one I have to go for, and again, you, you, we, we talked about this. Again, I'd go back to recruitment. Um, you don't always get it right. You don't always get it right. But, you know, there's 50-odd people work here. You, you can't get it. And, and you know, and, and that, you know, people change over time. So, Not to go off topic, how many people worked here when you took over? Well, there were, I think there were three full time. Obviously, then there'd be myself. And there was um, quite a lot of the girls in the clubhouse were part. So, I say another three part time. So, yeah, not many. Just, just, just a handful. Growth. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, um, you know, and, and obviously, you know, staff these days is very expensive. It's a very expensive commodity. But when you're customer facing like we are, you need these. It's not like we're, you know, we're not a bloated organisation. It's a lean organisation. You know, we don't have, you know, everybody's got a job to do, but you, you need them people, you know, it's, and then there's no easy rides, you know. Second. Second bad decision I've made here. Building the machinery shed twice. That's a really easy one. Because we actually, when I originally built it, I built it just behind me here in what is the, the car park area here. 
without really thinking that we were going to expand in the way we did. Um, and then when we got, you know, the idea of building the clubhouse, the clubhouse had a beautiful view of the machinery shed. <laughs> so I had to build it again out in the middle of the golf course. So that wasn't probably my finest hour. But again, you needed an, an incredible amount of hindsight to, uh, to, to miss that. So What did that cost? Was it a case of drop down, move, footings, back actually, yeah, yeah, we just basically put down a new footing, a new uh, base for the uh, concrete base, and then pretty much used the rest of um, what was there. We literally, it, it's virtually the identical same building. And it is a really good building. It's, it, it's well designed. It's a great building. But unfortunately, we needed the car. Well, you, could have, you could have kept that to yourself. You've done well yeah. there, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. Well, no, it's... it's, it, it's you know, you put me on the spot a little bit there, so I'm sure there's probably worse things that I've done. But you've got one these, more left. Got these more, ones yeah. coming to mind. <laughs> well, the, the last ones, and probably the last one, is, is more circumstantial, as you know, because we had a look at it before. We've just put a huge extension onto the driving range, and you know, I'm, I'm really, really proud of it. And there's, you know, there's all sorts that go with it as well. But when we went into that and started that process, we had no idea we were about to enter into the financial storm that we now find ourselves in. So, and, and again, Morris and I disagree about this. And, and uh, no, I, we don't disagree because he is right. Um, it was the right thing to do. We've got two new teaching bays there, which we've got six PGA teaching pros now, and we only had two bays. It's obviously very limited. Now we've got four bays plus the extra eight bays on the driving range. The place is absolutely flying, and we've put the top tracer screens in, which I was I was 50 feet, and the top tracer guys will tell you, you know, because they had to negotiate with me. I was not convinced by top tracer at all. But, um, wow, blimey, Charlie, that's that's gone. That is busy. Yeah. But I would say, with my time again, not knowing that there was the... The crisis around the corner. Could I have kept my powder a bit drier there? Maybe I could have done. Um, and I probably, on that basis, doesn't deserve to go into top three biggest mistakes I've ever made. Probably not. But certainly, you know, I'm aware of it. So what do you mean by that? Budget for doing it? It's well, yeah, more, yeah you, you, you know, you've got, you know, you've got to borrow the money. You've got to get hold of the money. It, it went considerably over budget, not because anything that we did wrong or it, it just became a much bigger beast, you know, as we went through planning it, instead of just being a few bays stuck on the end of the driving range, there's, you know, the, a huge office facility there, the, ma the maintenance facility, huge maintenance facility on the end, all the buggy charging areas, two teaching rooms fully equipped with everything, you know, these things don't come cheap anymore, so. Do you think building the machinery shed and then realising that you're expanding and you might need that, did you take more care then of yeah. the driving range and thinking, yeah. right, as this expands and gets bigger, rather sure. than maybe go as we are now, let's do this, let's do that, make sure we've got enough yeah. to you, grow. It's, it's difficult when, you, you, there's, you know, there's no pamphlet for doing this, there's no, no book, you know, right, how to, how to develop a golf course. You just gotta, you've, you've gotta trust yourself and you've gotta go with it. But what you don't ever want to do is spend the same money twice. You really don't want to do that because it's you know it's hard enough to earn the stuff. And I think we, you know looking back on what we did with the design of the golf course because as I said we did that within house. Um, we didn't get much wrong there. There's very little we've had to, you know. There are a couple of things that aren't quite hundred percent right, which we will you know in time we will deal with. But um, uh, I would like to think you know I'm, I'm I, I would have accepted at the time getting as little wrong as we did, but. Machinery shed, not so much. How busy is it now then? Is it more pay and play or members or stay No, over? it's. I would say it's about 50-50 in terms of income. We've got, um, <clears throat> we've always said, and we're in that position now, interestingly enough, we've always said 600 members would be full for us because we've got, you know, we've got uh, guests who stay here. We've got visiting parties. A lot of people like to come here, you know, um, from away. Um, but we're, we're not far off that now. Now, with the way things are, we're not entirely sure what's going to happen next year. Our fees here are, are very reasonable. Of course, we pay VAT on them, as I mentioned before. I think it's six hundred and sixty pounds. How much? Six hundred and sixty, including VAT. So, put, do you know yes. what I pay? I imagine you'd get it free, wouldn't you, man? Thousand and fifty. Wow. Well, Jordan's a nice golf course, though. With no it? driving range. No. No facilities like sure. this. Sure. Yeah, it, I think it's. I think we are. We've always tried we, we, because it started as entry level. You know, you kind of that's where you are in the you market. Get a creep, brother, jump. Yeah. When yeah. they remember, then do they get 
cheaper ball rates for the range or anything like that? You can put money on your card and get a discount on that. They get 10% discount in the clubhouse as well. You get a card that you, you use to get a discount so on there. So the fee for you is 660. That's right. Take your VAT off. About 500 and whatever it is. There's there's all the club fees as well. There's, the, there's about 30 quid's worth of handicap fees in the England golf. So you as a business get about 550 max? Yeah. Per member. Wow. Which is a challenge. Pop that up. That, <laughs> seriously, that is a, that's a bargain. Well, it probably is. I it think is. that's fair. You've got to offer the value and you've got to respect. The problem is I've got now, and I'm, I've now got to put the subs up whether I like it or not, whether it's a good or bad business decision. I've kind of haven't got a choice. Things have just rocketed. I mean, it's just gone off um, the scale. I'm sure your members are expecting it because well, they, they must realise what they're getting and the value they're getting at the yeah. moment. It's a very careful town, is Kendall, you have to realise that. I, I've got one for you. So I, I, I'm not involved at Charlton, but I speak to the Greens committee and everything because yep. I used to be on. Now, we had a problem where we were going to do some bunkers. You don't get the right sand. And I think it was budgeted for about 600 quid, just, just for a certain amount of sand. Not, I'm not saying we do loads of bunch, uh, bunkers, but that 600 quid is now £900. Oh, easy, yeah. Just easy. that material's gone up like in months. Well, top dressing. Yeah, well, top when we Sorry, built top dressing. That's yeah, it, we're top dressing, when we built yeah. the greens here, the top dressing was, and we got a cheat. I think we were at uh, maybe eighteen, nineteen pound a ton, and that is in the new year going to go to over eighty pound a ton. And that's just how it is. Semi rough cutter. The last semi rough cutter we bought, I think, was about forty thousand. The same model is now over eighty thousand, and you've got to order it about a year and a half in advance. To get it from, and this is a lot. Of, I mean, Brexit has been. I don't particularly want to get into political debates, but Brexit for golf specifically has been an absolute nightmare. Yeah. Well, so no. what, how's your budget then? Because obviously you will have a budget for your greens, right? Yeah. You, that's what you've got this year. That's it. Well, what happens is Warren comes to me, and he's literally just happened, and says, "This is my budget for 2023," and you have everything there from. You know, from whatever feeds and pesticides and fungicides you can get hold of, which are now limited, so as a result of which it's incredibly expensive. I mean, they, they've nearly trebled in price. Is that because that's all there is? That's and there's right. a demand like everyone Absolutely. wants Absolutely. Amply, they can charge what they want for them. I mean, it's insanity. But yeah, you go through the budget, and at the end of the year, you get a figure. Well, that figure, not including wages, has, has over doubled this year alone. And it's a lot of money. Forget your fuel and everything else, a lot of money. Does it, does it come with a budget? And you just go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or do you start no, prioritising and then pick through it? We have to work through it. And then I have to work back from there. Because what I've said is I'm not going to compromise on the golf course. You know, the first thing you can do when this is out is start making cuts. So I could just say to Warren, right, you've got to lose a couple of green staff. You can't have any machinery. You can't top dress. You can't put this application down. You can't do the bunkers. All that's gone. You need to half your budget. Um, at a time when we've just spent a lot of money and a lot of skill to get the course to where it is. that, In my opinion, that's the wrong thing to do. So what I want to do is continue to invest in that for the members and for the for the visitors. So I want to ring-fence that, if you like. It's a bit like, it sounds like the government now, but I want to ring-fence that. Um, and instead of making the cuts across the business, try and increase the income, try and increase your turnover to meet the, the, the cost demand that we've got. How much is a green fee? Um, it's about thirty-two pounds at the moment, which that needs to go up a little bit as well. I think that's quite that's quite good value. And some of the visiting party amounts are less than that. But yeah, it, it's, more deals, more people. Yeah, come but it's. It, 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 I mean, mo courses around here are generally sort of fifty, sixty, seventy pounds. But you go down to. Um, you know, anywhere. Well, I mean, memberships, like you say, down Manchester, anywhere. Thousand the, pounds common. Yeah, the, the, the but then again, though, in Scotland, where we've just come back from the islands, yep. four or five hundred quid. Absolutely. But hear me out. They'll have one greenkeeper and an helper. Yeah. Lynx yeah. course, so that, I would imagine a lynx is a sure. less to look after. Possibly, yeah. It has different challenges, but but I think all all golf is is, is going to have to. You know, I think a lot of people are in denial at the moment as to how serious the situation is. We're quite we're quite uh, good on all our figures and spreadsheets and everything. We want to know exactly where we are, and you know, we I feel like we're looking down the barrel at the moment. Not good at all. Not good. Do you think some golf clubs are going to go? Yes, I know that one in Bolton's just gone. Yeah, I, I don't do. know. I get a few emails. I really do. I really do because you know no business in the world has ever cut back its services and increased its car, it increased the cost of the price of it and done well. I mean that just doesn't work. You know people go elsewhere, so you've got to be really careful how you do this. You know.
Let me take you back then, talking of COVID. Yes. So all of a sudden, COVID comes round. You've now got a decision to make. You've got staff, you've got overheads. Yeah. You've got the upkeep of the course. Yeah. Did you cut back on the budget then? Did you keep things going? I mean, you've got to keep it to us. Well, it was, it was, unfortunately, we found ourselves in a bit of a perfect storm. Now, the first thing is to say, without the furlough scheme, we would have gone bust. Simple as that. So you would have gone bang? Yeah. Has that happened close before or? Yeah, it has. Yeah, it, we've been, we, we, we've, we've had a few, uh, we've had a few near misses. We had the, the Storm Desmond in 2015 uh, and that put us out, that, 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 that really put us out for some time. Although we were, you know, we were fully insured. We were with NFU. NFU looked after us really well. Um, so we bounced back onto our feet from that. Then there was the Greens disease that we talked about there. That was, we had to give £100 back to all the members. I was that, you know, it was that bad that we give up all the members £100 back on their card, um, you know, as, a, as an apology to stick with us. And they were very loyal. And then just when you sort of dusted yourself down from that, COVID, bang. Now, the problem we had here was, I don't know whose bright idea this was, if your rateable value was over £70,000, which ours is, you didn't get a loan or a grant. You know, the golf, a lot of golf courses around here, they all got 25 grand. Happy days. We didn't get anything. So our costs are more and we didn't get anything. But what Morris and I did uh, was we actually paid 100% wages. So obviously the furlough was 80%. But we, we topped that up and paid everybody right the way through uh, to make sure, you know, that they weren't suffering as well. All that didn't do That'll us. help you bond with the staff, though, that. I and think that's so, you yeah. You've got the best staff. Yeah, and, yeah. Again, yeah. Not, not all the staff. No, but <laughs> the not, most of them. not just bond with the staff. You've kind of earned that loyalty and respect, haven't you, as well? It goes both ways. It goes both ways. It does, it does. Yeah. And, it and does. again, you've looked after them, they're going to look after you. Yeah, and I think that's, that, that, that is how this place works. You know, it is... I think it's probably more of a meritocracy, you know, it, although it's a business, but everybody has their own shout. You know, if you work hard, you know, it, it isn't a... It's not a dictatorship where I'm going around pointing everybody, telling them what to do. It's just not that. You know, everybody's got their own little world and they're in charge of that and... You know, I oversee that, and and you need that trust two way relationship to make that work. I was going to say, if you played golf on COVID, but you probably best not put that. In. Well, no, not really. Um, th there were some benefits to COVID. In fact, um, what happened was um, Warren, because obviously he couldn't travel anywhere, he'd moved on to site here in one of the holiday lets, and you were allowed to work on the course. You're allowed to do that. So there were a lot of jobs that we did post getting the course back up to scratch from the disease that it had that we did during that when there was no one on the course you see so it was a great opportunity to bring them so when everybody came back after furlough it was in magnificent condition and he's kept it on from there so you know and that was a real big help so in essence really that allowed you i know take good from bad that allowed you to get ahead oh it did yeah if you were trying to look at the positive i mean trust yeah. me there was a, there's a, a sea of horrific negatives um, but that was the positive in that we actually got on top of the issues we'd had with the disease previously and, you know, and, and, and got beyond that. Although you own a wonderful golf course here. That's very kind, thank and, you. No, it is. And I mean, really mean that. That's very it's very kind. It's picturesque, it's a joy to play, it's a fantastic walk. It's a great golf course. What's your favourite golf course apart from your own? Um, I've always, of, of the... British Open course is my favourite's Birkdale. I think Birkdale is going back to what we said about, you know, a golf course being an exam paper. What you see is what you get at Birkdale. When you're on the tee, you know, it's, it's really difficult, obviously. But you kind of know what you've got to do. I love Birkdale. Uh, I love Kings Barnes. I've been fortunate to play that a couple of times. Um, and I absolutely love Valderrama. I don't know if you've ever had the chance. Played none of them. Well, you've got to get them on your list. You've got to get them on your list. Valderrama's extra. I'll tell you who's going there this year. Live Golf are going there. He always used to be on the European Tour. Don't know what's gone wrong, but Live Golf. It's, the most, it's not a long golf course. It's only, uh, by modern terms, I think it's possibly even less than 7,000 yards. Is it the one with the trees where your ball can stay oh, absolutely, in it? Yeah. It can not come down, it just gets it can swallowed stop up. up there. The first time I played a three iron off the first tee, and I was on the fairway. I was really quite pleased with myself. I got to my ball. I had no shot. I had to chip out 
I was on the fairway because if you just get in the wrong place, you have to, it's very tactical. And I love, I love risk reward golf. And that's basically what I've built here. This is a risk reward golf club. You've got options, you've yeah, got choices. The two you holes, go. Uh, the two short holes. Six and seven, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. You can get a birdie putt, but also you can come off of a six. Yeah. Quite yeah. easily. Lots of problems, but you've got to work out how you're going to play it. You've played some top golf courses, obviously. You obviously go around the golf courses. Are you playing and still looking to see? Oh, the is, there, is there any tips you can take oh, back I take here? Wherever I go, I take pictures. Yeah. To see something that really takes my eye, you know, and then I think a lot of people in the golf industry are like this. If you see something, you just think, well, that is really, really... might even be... The, I'll give you an example. The bins at Kings Barnes. They're absolutely really smart. So I just took, took a couple pictures. A guy up in Scotland, a guy called John, found him up. John Hunter, his name was. I want them bins here. And that was it. And I just love the design of them. And it's like little tiny things like that. You're always just thinking, oh, I like the way they've done that, you know. That's a rubbish story. Bins it? It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a rubbish yeah. story. Where have you wheelie been, though? <laughs> That's what I'm going to ask you. Carry screen, if we're going to put it in the papers, designed by who? Well, I'll tell you how it worked. Um, there was uh, three of the golf professionals who worked for me at the time, Dave Turner certainly, and Gary Wilsonholm. Now, Gary Wilsonholm, um, I think he's in the Seychelles as we speak. Uh, he, he's just moved, actually. He lived on site here for a lot of years. His mum was struggling with the stairs a little bit, so he's had to move to a bungalow. Um, and I got Gary in as well, and I said, right, guys, I've designed a golf course here. We're going to rebuild this golf course. I'm not going to show you what I've done because I don't want to influence what... I want you to go away. If you can, come back to me in a month and show me what you think you would do with the holes. And then we all convened for a whole day. We sat downstairs in the clubhouse, and hole by hole. Again, I didn't show them what I'd got. I looked at everything they'd got and, of course, took all the best bits of there and some of the stuff I'd done got binned and replaced with some of the what they'd done. So I would say it was a combination of, you know, some of the pros I had here, myself, Gary Wilson home, some of his ideas, and just listening to people in general, you know, over the years, you know, all the time, people saying, wouldn't that be a great hole if you did that? And yeah. Is it a labour of love? I think it is, yeah. For a lot of years, you'd have to describe it as as, as a, a, a lifestyle business, I think is what they call it, a lifestyle business. I think these days now, it, it's probably gone beyond that, you know, especially since Morris's involvement, Morris's, you know, he, he, his, his strategic and structural knowledge have taken this to a completely other place. Um, but to start with, certainly when, in the early days, you know, I would get up in the morning, cut the greens, come back, drive to Morrison's, go and get the soup and the sandwiches and everything, come back. Me and Dave Turner, who was the pro, would make all the butties and the soup up. 10 o'clock, he would go teaching. Then the girls would come in, and me and the girls and my mum would be serving the soup to the punters who were coming in. And then in the afternoon, I'd go and start building the driving range with a guy called Robert, an old friend of mine. Who was, and, that, and that is a lifestyle business. That is a labour of love. Proper yeah. hands-on owner. Oh, sure. At that, at that stage. Well, I'm still, you know, I live on site. You know, I've moved back onto site. I'm on site here with uh, uh, Amy, my wife, and my kids. I'm still seven days a week. I don't physically do anywhere near as much hands-on work as I used to, but I, it's still it's still 70 hours a week. Doesn't matter which way you want to change it. You know? How often do you get to enjoy this fabulous golf course? Uh, but probably not as often as I'd like to. I have played for a few years. I didn't play at all, and then this year we started playing on Saturday afternoon. Just because I've got I've started a family late in life, and I've got a. I've got an eight-year-old and a seven-year-old, but they're interested in golf now. So that my golf's moving in that direction. So I would, there's, um, you know, there is no greater pleasure than when you're out there and my little boy, my little girl, the boat, Eddie and Erin, they're both, uh, they're really good. You know, they have lessons here. And so I play a little bit with them and I play, and my wife, incidentally, she's a, she's a class golfer. Um, she qualified, well, we both qualified for the final of Trilby Tour this year up at Dundonald, but we couldn't go because we couldn't get babysitters. Uh, but she's a good player as well. So I like to see the future of my golf being very family-based, you know. That is proper quality family time, that. Oh, it's great, yeah. Yeah, it's, there's, there's no... Uh, you just can't beat it, no. you know. And he had... Uh, and I actually videoed it as well. My little boy, I think he was seven at the time. He got a two on the first. He, he's driver onto the green. And would you believe it, he hold his putt. And he had a two, you know, and, and 
he's he's uh, diamond that, isn't it? Oh, yeah. it's great. Yeah. The other thing we used to do as well is the rock on the back of the green there. This is I've got this on video as well. What he loved doing as a little boy when he was only like two or three was chipping off the rock down onto the green and again videoed it would you believe it he held it so you know so yeah it's family family golf for me now yeah who's the most famous person that's ever played this golf course probably you i yeah, would think good one. i'll crack the jokes <laughs> you all <laughs> you all liam <laughs> you got how, to how much was that again <laughs> um, i think the one probably the, the and this was actually before i had it because i saw the pictures and i've heard all the stories was norman wisdom i don't know if you remember norman I wisdom do, yeah. real old famous uh, british comedian film star he, he is massive in albania <laughs> he was never massive He's oh. massive in Albania. I remember England like playing yeah, Albania yeah. and they had him walking around because they weren't watching much telly then. I'm telling you, Norman Wisdom were massive in Albania. So right? Yes, knowledge is a bomb. Maybe that's why they all want to come over here then. <laughs> Maybe. They all want to meet Norman. I don't know. Let's finish on a good one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to word it twice just in case I say the wrong thing. Exit plan or where do you see yourself in 10 years? All the I think all all good businessmen should have an exit plan, and you won't be surprised to find out that I haven't got one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I see it. I see it in a really strange way, actually, which is which is wrong. I mean, you know, if somebody rocked up, and you know, if if um, some hotel group rocked up, and you'd have to have a a good think about it. But I'm, you know, I've got to do something with my life, and this is what I do. You know. I've got, do I want to hand it over to my children? I probably don't. I'd only want to do that if they really wanted to do it. I don't, I'm not a great, I'm a great believer in people finding their own way. Um, but as a legacy, it would be a great thing to hand over. But I suppose the last thing to say on that is, and I'm sure a lot of other golf course proprietors would say this, you don't really consider yourself as the proprietor. You just consider yourself as the current custodian. You know, we're all just passing through at the end of the day. You know, we're all on a conveyor belt. And this is just my time here. And, you know, somebody somebody else's time will come. It might get bought by the members. It might become a members club again. Who knows? I don't know. I don't actually have anything in, in you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm 50 now. Do I see myself here in 10 years? Yeah, I probably do. Um, you know, I've, I've still got an awful lot to do here. That I, would, I don't feel like I've finished by any means. Um, we have the developments business, which is, you know, converting, you know, derelict old properties into up the Lake District into fantastic new homes. Really enjoy doing that as a sideline to this. So the truth is I don't have a, a guaranteed exit plan. I would like to retire, but still have it. So I could drop in a couple of times a week, talk to the, the you know, the heads of the teams who frankly already, they're all miles better at what they do than I am. There's very little I can add to what they do. They're, you know, they're on another level to me. So I think that's probably the plan is, is retire while still being involved. Well, Graham, I think, you know, the members here are very lucky to have you. Uh, well, the very lucky you have is an owner of the golf course. You've improved it dramatically and it's still going to be ongoing. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And yeah, yeah. it sounds like you've still got a lot of goals to, to so. achieve. I think so. And it's been an absolute pleasure today, it thank has. you. Well, it's a pleasure to welcome you two guys here. What an honour it is for me to meet you as well. I've really enjoyed your company. I've loved the golf, great fun. I hope everybody else enjoys it. And I'm, it's like a little mini destination, this now. Yeah. I'm feeling it's a little destination. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what we are is, 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 is we're quite adaptable. For example, we've had to change the dress code today to allow Liam <laughs> to wear that top. <laughs> You know, we're, we're very good at moving things, you know, we're very modern, you know. You did say you weren't going to mention that, but now you have mentioned it. <laughs> well, are, the, are, are the cars safe in the car park? <laughs> Get that hood up. Yeah. Well, I'd hopefully you enjoyed that. And uh, Greg, maybe we'll come back in a few years' time, see where Cary Screen is then. You'd but... be incredibly welcome. Absolutely. Brilliant. Nice to see you guys. Brilliant. Thank you very Thank much. You. Cheers.